Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. Uh, this is the last seminar of this quarter and uh, this academic year, so thank you all for coming and participating so actively. Uh, first, uh, Rachel and I would like to thank uh, Professor Will Chu sitting here for uh, introducing us to today's speaker, uh, uh, Josh. Uh, uh, and. Um, suggesting that he give an energy seminar today. So we're very grateful to, to Will. And in return, we asked Josh to introduce, uh, sorry, Will to introduce Josh, sorry. Uh, so uh, most of you probably know Will Chu, a professor of uh, material science and engineering, energy science and engineering, and photonics here at Stanford, uh, as well as several uh, uh, initiative uh, leads uh, and also a senior fellow at the Precord Institute for Energy. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Will to introduce Josh. John, thank you very much. Um, it is really my great pleasure to introduce uh, Josh Siling from Ansu Venture. Before I introduce Josh, I thought I would just point a few numbers out to give you a sense of how critical this particular talk is. If we continue to emit greenhouse gas at the same rate we are today, breaching the 1.5 degree C over pre-industrial level will only take seven more years. But most of the technology that we have been deploying takes decades to deploy, even for the first 1%. So there's a real mismatch in timing. I think today's talk, Josh is gonna emphasize how do we efficiently transfer innovation at the early stage level, all the way to scale. And there's actually not too many examples to look at in the past, so we're writing the book as we go. And Josh's role in looking at these early venture ideas is absolutely critical. So I think we're today very pleased to hear about his mindsets when it comes to picking and betting on new ideas uh, in the venture side, and how does he see things progress all the way to scale impact at the planetary level. So Josh is a very unusual investor because he came from a really technical background. So in addition to, is it chemical engineer, right? Uh, from yep. UC San Diego. He has been a battery engineer uh, at one of our uh, local battery startup, Lighten, for about four years. Um, and there he was working on the front lines of making you know, what is arguably the most inexpensive battery available, lithium sulfur, to work at commercial scale. Um, and then after that, after a few other stints, um, he is now in his current position directing uh, the investment strategies, especially in the energy space, with a heavy focus on the connection between energy and materials. And one thing I'm excited to hear from Josh today is his approach on decarbonizing hard to decarbonize sectors. In my mind, those are sectors which are mostly dominated by commodity, things like cement, steel, heat, in which there's really no differentiation on the product itself. So how do we go about taking those early stage venture ideas in which the economics is very unfavorable on day one, but see it all the way through to impact you know, years or a decade down the road? So with that introduction, Josh was so excited to welcome you to Stanford again to talk about your viewpoints and mindset as an investor and how that benefited from your engineering training. That's welcome, Josh. Thanks, Will. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Will. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Josh Styling. I'm an investment director at Onzi Partners, and you know, as Will mentioned, uh, the my talk today will really focus on you know, scaling and financing industrial technologies. Um, and I'll be using my view from, from venture capital and from where I see technologies and where we invest uh, to where we try and exit them. And so you know, before you know, we get into you know, the commercialization and the scaling problems with industrial tech, I think it's important for you to understand the lens from which a venture capitalist thinks and identifies different types of opportunities. Um, and so I'll give a, you know, a quick introduction on my road in, into venture, uh, what my firm does, and the verticals that we're focused in. 
Um, and then, you know, how the VC, you know, the venture capital space operates. How does a firm uh, make money? Where do we get money from? Um, how do we evaluate opportunities? And then finally, I'll, I'll go into more um, of how we view, you know, scaling and commercial, commercialization problems in the industrial space. So, um, Will, you already touched on a little bit of this, so I won't spend too much time on, on my intro, but I'm a chemical engineer by training. I went to UCSD, um, and after my undergrad, I actually had the opportunity to go play water polo overseas for a little bit uh, professionally, so I played in Australia uh, and in Spain. And then, you know, it gave me a great opportunity to travel, uh, but in 2016, you know, it's time to come back and get to work. And so I started work as a process engineer at Leiden, which is about, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes down the road, uh, where I did a significant amount of my work on lithium-ion batteries. So chemistries like lithium sulfur and silicon anode, which are higher energy density systems at lower cost, uh, as well as some electrochemical sensors and just scaling up the, the processes to make our materials. Um, I spent a lot of time in the lab and wanted to work with people a bit more. So I went back to UCSD, uh, got my MBA, and I've now been at ONZU Partners for the last three years, uh, where my focus is primarily on electrification and energy storage. Uh, some of these companies up here are the ones that I work with. Uh, they're pri primarily in the lithium ion space uh, with a few in geothermal energy technology, uh, microgrid design and operation platforms, um, and one that is uh, fluid mechanics. So my firm, uh, Anzu Partners, we were founded in 2014, uh, and we focus primarily on you know, hard, critical uh, technologies in industrial tech and in life sciences. Uh, we have about a billion dollars of assets under management spread across three different funds and SPVs. Uh, and, you know, we target, you know, essentially three verticals, which is energy, uh, technology, and then life sciences. Um, we're all over the country. We have offices in San Diego, Washington, D.C., Boston, Tampa. I'm out of the San Diego office. Um, we have over 35 portfolio companies, uh, 12 investors, and over 50 people on support roles. So this is you know, HR, talent, accounting, uh, business strategy, and development. Uh, so like I mentioned before, you know, when we look at these three different verticals, they're you know, our hallmarks of, of what is interesting to us. So you know, anything that provides more sustainable materials uh, is critical to our supply chains and you know, electrification in general. Um, and then, you know, building energy dependence here in the United States. Uh, in our technology sector, it's more on, you know, manufacturing, automotive, aerospace, um, you know, critical AI hardware. And then on the life science sec sector, we don't invest in therapeutics, but we invest in the tools that can accelerate drug, dis drug discovery or biomanufacturing. And then when we do these investments, Right, we like to co-invest with uh, you know the relevant industry players. So you'll probably see you know a number of uh, you know relatable uh, you know logos up there, um, and these are companies in the energy space, electric, uh, electronics, um, you know different types uh, of players that can be ultimate acquirers and users of the technologies that we invest in. Um, so now I'll give a quick overview of you know, how the VC firm operates. And by and large, it's a little bit of a black box of an industry. Um, most people think of venture capitalists as people who wear Patagonia vests and you know, throw money at entrepreneurs. And that's kind of what we do, but there's a little bit more to that. <laughs> so there's three essential elements uh, to a venture firm. Uh, the first is the general partners. These are the people that uh, make the decisions on where to put the money. And, and they do the investing. Uh, number two is limited partners. These are our investors. So these are uh, individual, you know, high net worth individuals, uh, in a, you know, state innovation funds, hedge funds, private equity. Uh, we can get capital from a number of different sources. And then, you know, the third element is the portfolio companies. So this is where we put our money. Uh, this is where we invest. And funds are, are typically set up uh, to have around a 10-year life. Uh, it depends on what type of technology you're investing in. So, you know, on the high end, uh, there are some firms that last around 15 years. Um, energy Impact Partners, Breakthrough Energy, uh, these funds are meant to be very long because of the technologies that they invest in. On the shorter end, you might see some funds that are seven, eight year periods. And this is typically for, you know, software. Uh, you know, technologies that you can ramp really quickly 
and you can expect to get returns within that time window. Okay, so how do we make our money? Uh, there are two ways. Um, the first one is through management fees. This is essentially us taking 2% of the assets that we have under management to pay for our salaries, our expenses, when we go travel, stay in hotels. This is where most of that money comes from. Um, and the number two is the carried interest. Now, this is where we actually can make outsized returns if we do well. Um, and this is where we take about 20% of the profits that we make um, that goes back into our fund. So say, for example, we raise $100 million uh, to go out into the world and invest, and then 10 years later, we make a billion dollars. That's really good. We did a good job. Um, and so the way that billion dollars get split up is um, our LPs get – you know, they're 100 million back, you know, minus the management fees that paid for us. And then they get 80% of that 900 million of profits. So that's what, like 720 million uh, back to our investors and then 180 million uh, back to us. Now that's, you know, a great outcome. And, uh, you know, we hope to achieve something like that, uh, but it doesn't always play out that way. Um, and then we also typically usually invest in the first half to first third of the fund life, right? If we invest in the first three to five years, that gives those investments, you know, an additional seven to five years to mature and for us to get exit returns, um, whether through M&A, IPO, secondary transactions. Uh, there's a couple different ways that that can split out. And so, you know, a question that we get all the time is, you know, is the idea big enough for venture capital? Um, you know, if we have a target 10-year fund, you know, what is the type of return that we need for investors to put money into our vehicle, right? So in this scenario, right, you're an LP that has to make the decision between putting it into a venture fund or you can put it into the S&P 500. Now, there's obviously other things that you can do with this, right? You can, you know, put it, into, you know, put it under a rock or put it, <laughs> you know, aside for a rainy day. Um, but if you put it into the S&P 500, uh, you can expect you know, roughly 7 to 10% annual return. And so every t 10 years, what you would expect to get is around 2 to 3x three, three of your money back. Now, your money is relatively liquid, meaning that you have access to it, and you're also investing in vehicles that are relatively low risk. When you put it into a venture fund, uh, you cannot access that money. Right? You are giving that money to the fund for 10 years, um, where you may be able to get it back through distributions but by and large, you're probably not going to you know, have access to that money for a long time. And so when you look at that, you don't have access to the money, um, and you can make a 2 to 3x return safely by putting it into the S&P 500, there's a hurdle that we have to get over. Right? And that hurdle is around a you know, minimum, we have to return about 3 to 4x of, of that initial capital for this to make sense. So if we look at two portfolios here, um, on the left-hand side here, you have one portfolio which isn't quite big enough, right? In the venture space, you know, we, we invested our money in, you know, let's, let's call it 10, 12 different companies. Uh, we struck out on a few. We hit a few singles, a few doubles. Uh, you know, one or two companies got a 4X. If you average this across the entire portfolio, you now have, you know, 1.5X return on that money, right? That's 4% annually you could have made more money putting your money into bonds. On the second portfolio here, you know, we, we did poorly on a few. We had a few singles and doubles. And then we had two companies that 20 x right, that did really, really well. Now we look at our average of the portfolio, and this is about a 4.2x. So annual return of around 15%. So we did well. Let's do it again. Um, and so when we evaluate companies, we have to see that each one of these, you know, each one of the 12 companies here has the potential for an outsized return, right? It can do really, really well. And so whenever we evaluate and, you know, go into our investment committee, we have to prove that this company has a technology or a product that can address a really large market. And when you look at, you know, the VC industry, this is uh, some statistics from Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, you know, we get investments wrong quite often. And it's really that those few select ones that actually make the venture industry uh, capable of these outsized, outsized returns, right? About 6% of these deals account for 60% of the profits, 
right? So even with a, you know, a firm like Andreessen, which is very experienced, been in this space, had a lot of winners. They've also had a lot of losers that just haven't gone the distance. So it, it really comes down to you know, being able to find those companies that can, uh, that can make that outsized return. And so you know, that begs the question, you know, is the opportunity or is the technology or is the business right for venture capital? And it basically comes out into three different buckets, right? You know, bucket number one is, yeah, it's going to address a big multi-billion dollar problem. And we have different types of capital that's available for that. Uh, first is, you know, your financial VC, like Anju Partners. Uh, and then you have corporate VCs. Uh, TDK is, you know, a big electronics firm. But, you know, Toyota, Porsche, uh, a lot of auto OEMs, Lockheed Martin Ve Ventures are corporate venture capital arms which can provide money uh, for big uh, and growing opportunities. You know, bucket number two here is that you have a highly useful product, uh, but it's only applicable for a few types of customers. You know, let's say you have, you know, some super high-tech astro, you know, physics optical gear that um, people use to analyze the stars, right? There's like a very limited amount of people that can actually use that. And so while it's super useful, it's not going to give you the return that makes it um, useful for you know, a venture firm to invest in. And then the last one is you know, kind of the want to have uh, versus need to have product that you, know, you might go into like a Kickstarter or put it up on Shopify. You know, this could be something that is highly useful or you know, it, it's you know, nice to have for your, your population of Southern California surfers by having a surf rack or maybe you get cold at night, so you get a Snuggie, right? It's nice, but you don't need it. Okay. All right, so the next section here, I'm going to talk specifically about, you know, what we look for and how we analyze different opportunities. <clears throat> so I think the first thing, um, we really need to distinguish between you know, software and industrial hard tech. I think a lot of you hear about the venture capital industry and you hear about these, you know, outsized returns that you get from these companies that, you know, kind of started from nothing and came out of a garage. You know, by and large, that, that is true for some companies, but not for others. Uh, in the software space, right, you can build your products very quickly. Um, you can release them and iterate on them uh, at, at a rapid pace. And there's limited technical risk, right? If you lock you know, six computer engineers in a room with Mountain Dew, you could probably come out with a product in six months. You can't do that in the industrial tech space. Uh, you know, two examples here which are relevant. Meta, formerly Facebook, uh, was able to release, release their first product in about two to three months. Um, this is less than five engineers, and honestly, probably was mostly Zuckerberg, you know, cranking away with his hoodie on. Um, and he had little to no funding. It, Box, which is you know, a cloud platform that a lot of industries and companies use to um, you know, put all their data in, uh, you know, their ideation to first product was around you know, half a year to eight months. And they had, again, you know, less than five engineers and less than 500K in capital. Now, these are two like, select cases. This isn't true for all software companies. Um, but when you look at the industrial tech startup space, it's a lot different. Right? These are products that have long R&D and commercialization timelines. Um, they have high capital requirements to get out into the world. They, you know, have IP issues that are hard to, harder to solve. And it really requires, you know, an ecosystem of support, um, you know, in supply chain, manufacturing, product development uh, that isn't required in, in a SaaS space. So if you look at, you know, our favorite EV company here in the U.S., Tesla, uh, it took them five years to get their first product out, which was the Tesla Roadster. Uh, it, they had 300 full-time employees at this time, and it took you know, over $100 million in capital to get there. Uh, another company, Enphase Energy, uh, which some of you might not be familiar with, but they make micro-inverter technology, which hooks up to a solar panel and makes it more efficient. Uh, that company took three years to get their first product out. Uh, you know, it's like this big. It's, it's not you know, as big as an EV. And they had 50 you know, full-time employees and around $20 million, uh, raised before that first product went out. And so, you know, industrial tech requires unique uh, funding to get it off the ground. 
And there's a number of different funding vehicles uh, and entities that exist that can help along the, this journey, right? You know, at the research phase, uh, companies like the NSF, uh, National Science Foundation, DARPA, RPE, are there to really advance the science and help improve U.S. competitiveness in, in a certain area. Um, the next stage, right, as you go from first principles and, you know, that first little application into a relevant prototype, you now have, you know, SBIR, which is a government funding entity, uh, angel grants, seed grants, um, incubators. You probably have heard of Y Combinator in the past. There are entities like this that exist but for industrial tech. And then finally, you know, once you've hit that prototype that is relevant and looks like something that you might buy in the industry, that's when you start scaling it up into manufacturing and getting it bigger. And that's where venture capital, a private equity, and then corporate money, and then the big government grants that are coming from the IRA and the BIL come into play. Um, and at this stage, it really becomes important that you know, it's less of a science project that we're funding, but a product that can make money. And as you become more mature in your life cycle, uh, this becomes more and more important, right? Venture will take more risk than a corporate that's going to be spending $500 million on a project. If you spend that much money, you're going to want to know that it works. So when it gets to us, to venture, what do we actually look for? Um, and we built you know, a relatively simplified framework here that kind of outlines the big questions that we like to ask uh, when we see a new opportunity. Now, this isn't you know, everything, but these are the major ones that um, we like to drill down on immediately. And the first one is, you know, why now? You know, why is this innovation going to make a difference today? Right? Is there something that has enabled this technology in terms of manufacturing? Or has there been a breakthrough? Or is the market uh, you know, willing to now purchase or buy this type of innovation? Um, the second one, which is you know, arguably just as important, is do we like this team? Um, humans are the ones who are going to be solving the problems, who are going to be doing the day-to-day, -day, who are going to be able to push this technology from you know, the ideation phase to the commercialization phase. So having the right people involved is absolutely essential. Um, the third is, you know, is there an obvious and quantifiable value proposition? You know, what value are you actually going to be providing to your customer? Um, we see this a lot, but you know, we'll see a first-time founder coming out of a PhD program who uh, says, like, hey, look at this technology that I built. You, you want it? Invest in it? And there's no really discernible value proposition to it. Right? We don't know, like, you know what type of cost decrease you're going to get over the conventional solutions that are available. Or you know, how does this increase performance? Or is it more sustainable? Or is it more accessible for different consumer groups? Right? There's different ways that you can bucket this. Um, and then, you know, like I mentioned before, is the market big enough? You know, is this addressing a big problem in a big industry? If it's not, it's hard for us to get involved. Uh, fifth one, you know, can they, can they even make it? Um, you know, there's some interesting examples that I'll get into a little bit later. Um, but we're not here to fund a science project, right? We want to fund a product that is going to be able to make a material impact in its industry. And then the sixth one is, I guess, you know, our little framework of saying, like, you know, can we build it in a weekend? You know, all the investors that we have at Onzu are, you know, previous engineers and scientists, and we've all worked in industry before. And so we kind of joke when we see something that's very simple, like, well, we might be able to do this ourselves. But what this question does is it makes us ask, like, you know, what technical or expertise or intellectual property moat is there around this technology? You know, it, what's going to stop from, you know, Apple or Tesla from doing this themselves and, and taking you over? Right, that becomes very important, um, especially if the, the technology is very valuable. So I'll drill down a little bit further into like each of these questions and provide a few examples um, from what we've seen in industrial tech. <clears throat> so the first one, you know, why now? Um, a lot of times we see that you know the why now question. You know, why is this innovation you know capable of 
selling now is that it's a rehash of some old concept and you know some challenge has been solved you know either technically the way it's manufactured the way that it's delivered to customers um, maybe a new customer segment has opened uh, and then maybe there's you know previous industry forces have just completely run out of steam and there is space for a new solution set to exist and oh, there's um, an interesting example of this is Solyndra. Um, some of you might be familiar with this company, but it was a company that came out in the early, mid-2000s, and they had a, a really unique and innovative uh, cylindrical solar cell technology. And what value this brought is that you could scale this up and that you could have you know, an array of these cylinders with a reflective panel underneath. And so the sun could hit that reflective panel and then go up into the bottom of the cylinder. All right, so in theory, you could capture more energy. You could have higher performance in the same area that you would have a 2D uh, photovoltaic cell. Now, you know, while it was innovative and it did perform well, there was a lot of challenges associated with this tech. Right? For one, because it was in such an interesting form factor, manufacturing it was really difficult. They had to come up with some new fabrication and manufacturing processes just to make this device. And what they ended up doing is you know, they had to build the manufacturing, and they had to build the technology. And that made it very costly. They were also competing at that time with a Chinese market that was dropping the price of solar cells incredibly fast. Um, and so, you know, what ended up happening is that they didn't have, you know, the techno-economics to really compete. And, you know, you couple this with their supply chain complexity, uh, some financial mismanagement, uh, some additional market forces, and this company ended up failing. Right? They went bankrupt in 2011, and 1,100 employees were let go. We'll contrast this with you know, Enphase Energy. Like I'd mentioned before, they make this microinverter technology that hooks up to a single solar panel and helps make it more efficient. Uh, this is as opposed to what was used before, which were string inverters, which bunched all these solar panels together and treated them as one rather than optimizing each panel for how much energy capacity it could produce. Now, this tech was not necessarily new at the time that Enphase came out with it. Microinverters existed, uh, but for you know, certain reasons, they were hard to produce, they were hard to manufacture, and what Enphase did is they optimized the designs that were used for microinverters at the time and made it uh, feasible to, to mass produce. And so they solved these challenges and they introduced their product and they were able to immediately improve the energy yield, uh, the system reliability, and the scalability of solar deployments uh, anywhere they went. Um, you know, additionally, it was super simple to install and user-friendly for the technicians who were using them. And they didn't require any novel manufacturing and utilize the ex existing supply chains that were already in place. And so when you contrast you know, Enphase versus Solyndra, Solyndra had a to create this whole new ecosystem that ended up not being competitive with you know, the Chinese cells that were being made uh, at scale. Well, Enphase just innovated on something that had already existed, made it more efficient, and you could already access it and manufacture it at scale. And now, you know, today, Enphase is a very healthy company. All right, number two, uh, do we love this team? Um, look, humans, humans are more important uh, than technology. You know, technology is kind of the table stakes, but the people behind it are going to be the ones that push it all the way through. And so when we evaluate, you know, these, these companies, you know, it's a long-year relationship that we have, you know, five to ten years. And so we really don't want to be working with jerks, right? You know, smart assholes who think they know, you know, what's right for the company. And it, it's hard to work around those people. You've probably been in a group project before where, you know, someone was... You know, clearly smart, but difficult to work with. And if you have to do that for 10 years, uh, you can have very strained relationships. Uh, we also look uh, for a CEO that has you know, strong communication skills, a strong leadership, and is willing to share the pie with others. Uh, one issue that we see actually quite often is that first-time founders who you know, create the technology uh, end up having a hard time hiring experts in the field because they you know, feel like they have built this technology and they own it and it's hard for them to share. Uh, and that's not always the case, but it's something that happens uh, quite often. And so, you know, 
being able to work with them to you know, hire on the right people to lead the company and help push the technology or marketing or business forward is, is very valuable. Um, <clears throat> having an experienced technical leader is also incredibly important, right? Someone who's worked in the industry before has gone through product development in a relevant uh, field or product set um, can help you avoid uh, a lot of the hurdles and issues that would come up if you don't have the right person there. Uh, diverse teams are also you know, historically uh, much better than you know, a group of people that are very similar and think in the same way. Right? This is you know, diversity in background, skill set, perspective. Right? By having different people around the table, you can problem solve in innovative and creative ways. Or if you have the same group of people that are from you know, the same background, skill sets, whatever, they're going to encounter and hit the same roadblocks. So diversity is a way to introduce creativity into the organization. Um, and then having you know, an experienced and connected business leader is important, right? Someone who knows the industry, knows the relevant players, knows who to talk to, uh, can help accelerate uh, your commercial pipeline and, and getting in front of the right people who are decision makers uh, in their organization. Josh, could you wrap up in 10 minutes for a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah. I'll go fast. Okay. So uh, one interesting example of this is the Tesla effect. Uh, a bunch of the engineers and leaders that went through Tesla uh, went through the rigors of you know, scaling uh, you know, one of the first electric vehicles that was introduced in mass to the market. And they ended up going on to create, uh, you know, some of the most well-performing companies in the clean tech space. Uh, you know, Gene Bertachevsky, J.B. Straubel, um, Dorian West. Uh, three of these guys are uh, Stanford grads. So if you play your cards right. Um, <laughs> uh, they've created over, you know, 30 different companies. Uh, gotten $26 billion in funding. And... They've built credibility with investors because they've been through this process before. They understand the challenges, and they know what to do, right? Um, number three, so, you know, what value are you actually bringing to your customer? And this can bucket out in, in a lot of different ways. What performance enhancements, yield improvements, cost reductions, sustainability, uh, time to do, you know, a process? Um, you know, what, what is being enhanced or what is being improved and is it valuable to the customer. Um, one of the companies that we invested in at Onzu is, uh, is a company that has innovated on the battery manufacturing process. So when you manufacture a battery, uh, the first step of it is you make your electrodes, your anode and your cathode. And when you make these, you mix up a paint, you cast it on a foil, that foil goes through a big long, big, long dryer system, which takes up a ton of space and uses a ton of energy. Uh, what they've done, they've, they've removed the solvent. Right? So now you don't have to have the dryers. Now you don't have the solvent recovery. You have a lot more space that you can utilize in the factory. And you know, when you expand this to these, these big battery factories that are being produced today, uh, you can save around you know, 70 to $100 million per year. Uh, you know, I've heard from this before. You know, is the market big enough? Um, you know, we look at billion-dollar markets that have healthy growth rates. Um, you know, does the tech directly address the problems that are happening in this market? Um, you know, is there a credible story for them to make, you know, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars? You know, one mistake that we made in our portfolio was a company called Pivotal Systems. They're a gas flow controller that is the best in class. But it turns out that, you know, it's a relatively small market. Uh, there is only three or four real companies, which are semiconductor manufacturing companies that control this space. And it's very cyclical. And so while it's a good product, it wasn't able to get us the return that we wanted. Um, you know, contrast this with the battery recycling market, you know, being driven by you know, new EVs getting on the road, uh, energy storage, consumer electronics, right? These batteries are going to have to go somewhere someday. Uh, and you combine that with the amount of fabrication facilities that are going up for lithium ion, and there is a massive market that is emerging for us to keep these materials here in the U.S., uh, and provide circularity uh, for these materials that you know have already come into our supply chain. Can they make it? Okay. Um, we always look for demonstrations of the technology. Uh, you can 
pretty much put anything on paper, but until you actually see the thing demonstrated, it's hard to know that it actually works. Unfortunately, uh, a company like Theranos, uh, which had you know told investors that they were making a you know a device that could use droplets of blood to run all these analytical tests, uh, whereas before you needed lots of blood to do it, uh, didn't quite work. Right? They lied to their investors. I don't think they had enough diligence on the technology itself. You know, they were eventually found out. So, be diligent in what you look at. Uh, and then, you know, can we build it ourselves in a weekend? So, it's all about the technology moat. Um, you know, what intellectual property exists? Um, how far ahead of the market are you? Um, you know, do you have a strong IP portfolio? You know, these things are you know, what we consider when we look at these opportunities. So two good examples of that is, you know, one is ASML. Uh, that is the machine that makes all of your new age electronics. Um, I won't go into the details, but this thing is an absolute beast that we could not build in a weekend. Um, you know, 2,000, 2000 patents, 10 billions to develop in a couple decades. Uh, no one's catching up with them. Uh, something that is a little bit less aggressive, but another company that we're involved with is South 8 Technologies. They built uh, a liquid gas electrolyte for lithium-ion batteries, which provides a lot of value, uh, especially when it gets cold. You probably heard about the, the cold freeze uh, in the northern United States back in February. This type of technology would be able to operate without a heater. And they have 26 patents, and they completely own the liquid gas electrolyte phase. How much time do I have left? Five minutes. All right. Okay. Um, so strategies to employ uh, when scaling and commercializing these technologies. I'm, I'm going to move quick, so buckle up. <clears throat> so we see kind of a, this observed rule uh, that there's, there's three major proof points that any industrial tech company is going to have to go through to really commercialize their, their tech and get you know, these large offtake agreements with industrial players. And the first one is technical efficacy. You know, does your technology work in the form factor that is relevant to them? I'm using the Tesla 4680 cell uh, because you know, they wanted to introduce a product that had higher energy density, um, but it required a significant amount of energy engineering required. You know, mechanical integrity and thermal propagation were two big things that they had to engineer and design around. You know, so the first question you have to ask is, you know, is the unit going to work? You know, the second is, you know, scale and economics. As you take this unit into what is actually going to be the form factor that it's going to operate in in the industry, you know, does this scaled product actually work? Right? So for 4680 cell, this now goes into a battery pack. Does the battery pack work? Does it make sense to manufacture it? Is it low cost enough? And the third is you know, having a stable supply chain. Right? You know, Tesla is planning on making 200,000 of these a year. They're currently doing 125,000. And so, you know, from this unit cell, which goes into a pack, which now goes into a vehicle, do we have the materials? Do we have the engineering? Is the manufacturing at a high enough yield for this all to make sense to make uh, a product that you would buy, right? If any of these gets knocked off along the way, it, it starts to not make sense, right? And these are kind of like the three areas where you have to have significant proof. And so, you know, the common challenge that we see in this space, you know, one is long R&D timelines. It, it takes a while to machine. It takes a while to iterate. It takes a while to optimize. Um, this is not software. You just have to, you know, take your time to, uh, you know, solve these problems. And so the way that you know you can mitigate this is one, you need to you need to hire the best, right? The best people are going to be able to. They'll know what to do. They'll avoid a lot of the hurdles they might overcome. And development focus is crucial, right? A lot of these technologies in the space today are, are platforms, right? That's what makes them so valuable. But if you start diverging your focus into other areas, you start wasting time, resources, and money, right? And then you don't solve anything, right? So focusing is absolutely critical. And, you know, that kind of goes along with don't try to solve everything, right? There are, you know, portions of your technology which are unique to you, but there's also probably a lot which is not. And if you try and solve, you know, reinvent the wheel, you could have gone, you know, six months faster if you decided to partner with the, the right supplier. Uh, long commercial adoption cycles. 
uh, these decisions are not made in a matter of weeks. They're usually made in a matter of years. Getting anything into an electric vehicle takes about four to five years. And so the way that you need to engage is you have to figure out what the customer wants early, right? Don't make something they're not going to buy, right? You can waste a significant amount of time if you make, you know, continue to innovate on something that no one is actually going to work on. Uh, again, focus. Focus on one product. Be the best at one thing before you're the best at a lot of things. And then, you know, develop the right partners. You know, this goes along with, you know, the R&D timeline. Uh, you know, having the right partner can help you accelerate in a number of different areas. All right, number three. Uh, large capital requirements. These things aren't cheap. Um, it takes a while to get the infrastructure, uh, the equipment, and the supply chain in place to make these things. And, you know, the way that we've seen this, you know, be successful for, you know, the companies that are doing well in the space is, you know, they're leveraging government grants, right? They're, they're de-risking through... SBIRs and RBEs and NSF grants up front, and then they're going to, for venture capital at the right time. And then when they get to the scaling phase, right, they're smart about how they spend their capital. Uh, and then you know, building a strong investor syndicate, right, having the right partners with the right network and experience around the table can help you reduce the chance that you're going to make a same mistake that was made at another company in you know, one of these investors' portfolio. Uh, and then, you know, demonstrate customer demand. You know, there are ways that you can get customers to commit to you if you hit, you know, milestone X, Y, Z, right? If I do these things, then you'll do this, right? Having that, like, memorandum of understanding or letter of intent can help provide, uh, you know, this credibility and value to your customers or investors down the road when they think about putting money into the company. It's like, oh, wow, we have demonstrated demand here. Where am I at now? Sweet. All right. <laughs> so, look, there's a lot of opportunity in, in the energy transition space, right? I mean, take your pick, right? Electrification, transportation, the way that we make and transmit um, energy, you know, decarbonizing industrial technologies, whether that's steel, cement, uh, chemicals, um, or, you know, treat wastewater. You know, there's a lot of opportunities in the space to be more resourceful uh, with the materials and you know the the supply chain that we have at hand um, even in our own homes right moving from natural gas to heat pumps right is a way that we you know are going to require more electricity but we're going to emit less co2 and then you know as you i know some of you are soon to graduate here you know as you go out you know into the world you need to critically assess uh, the companies that you're involved with, right? You know, when you think about, you know, a new company opportunity, you're like, why, why is this company or why is this product or why is this thing that I'm going to do have a sustainable advantage? And you can, you know, kind of use this framework, you know, why now? And, you know, do they have a good team? What's the value? Um, and then, you know, everything in this space takes longer than you think it will, hands down. Even if everything goes according to plan, I think a general thing that we've seen is uh, it's probably going to take two years longer than that, at least. And then, look, wherever you decide to go, um, you know, this kind of goes along with the no jerks, but, you know, be excellent, um, you know, be humble, and then, you know, always respect the people that you're around. You know, most of the opportunities for work that you get are, are not from, you know, cold applying into, you know, some job. It, it's through something that you know or something that vouches for you. Um, and, you know, that's going to be, that's how I got in the venture. You know, I, I had no intention of being an investor, actually. I wanted to be a product manager. Uh, but I was at a barbecue, and I, was, you know, got to be good friends with a few of my MBA classmates. And, you know, I met my now boss who was telling me about venture, and, you know, I, I got a shot. If I tried the cold apply into this place, I don't think they ever would have let me in. Um, and so... You know, I think the relationship aspect of business is so important that I think it's a little bit left behind when you think about, you know, the technical and meritocracy of, you know, scaling these things up. You know, you'll find more opportunity by treating others well and working hard uh, than you will by, you know, staying in your lab and being an asshole. So that's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Josh.
for the inside look at your uh, uh, pathway into uh, venture capital. It seems like you've learned an awful lot in a short period of time. I particularly, I think the audience would agree, like the examples you put in, which really brought a lot of the conceptual things to life. We now have five to ten minutes for questions in the room, sir. Thank you for this enlightening talk. It was very inspiring. Uh, but I want to uh, put one comment to the Cylindra example. It's a myth that it was due the failure to cheap uh, Chinese cells. Already in 2008, there were serious concerns about the technology, and they were raised, but they were argued away. And at that time, there was no Chinese cheap cells. It was still Japanese, German uh, dominated. Just mm -hmm. to put it correct, I mean, three years later, you were correct, the Chinese flooded the market. <laughs> yeah, there was, a, there was a number of uh, issues with Solyndra uh, from the get-go. Thank you. This is Stanford, after all. Somebody was going to know that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go over on the far side and then back up here and then over here. You know, among the technologies that you look at, because uh, you see so many different things, that just <coughs> even within your, just your space, what technologies are people not appreciating that they should be appreciating that? Probably uh, <clears throat> material synthesis. Um, I'll use battery materials as, as an example. Um, the, the supply chain today is completely owned by China. Um, nearly 90% of the refining and the processing is done uh, in, in China. And this is for battery materials. This is for you know, critical rare earths, metals. Uh, and we are heavily dependent upon China for all that. And finding innovative and you know, clean technologies that can be made in the U.S., is incredibly difficult, right? Because, I mean, the way that they do it today um, isn't necessarily clean um, for, for some of them. And so, is, you know, establishing the supply chain here is like, well, that's good, but, you know, you have to make it cost competitive and, and sustainably cost competitive, right? We can't rely on government grants for a long time. And so innovations in that space, I think, are, at least for me, particularly interesting um, because, you know, it can provide, you know, domestic supply chain security, and it could eventually provide you know lower costs and you know higher value products that come from it. Okay, then right here. I was wondering what is the network that Enzu has that's unique about it, and what um, is sort of the unique value add? Yeah, I would say as far as the venture firm goes, we are very very active with portfolio companies post investment. So one of the slides that I showed said that we have like 50 back office employees. So. When we get involved at you know the late C, the early Series A level, they're generally like I don't know ten to twenty people, and so you know we bring talent acquisition people to help hire the team, um, accounting, business strategy and services, manufacturing and operations, and so we try and you know flesh out the organization. We're not going to come in and like actually do the experiments, but we're going to try and you know get everyone around you to support you know the product development and maturity of the company, and then you know on the kind of you know the connection side. We're, you know, co-invested with, you know, a lot of these big strategic companies. Uh, we have, you know, engineers and scientists on our team who have gone through these, you know, product development cycles before. And, you know, I'd say our value has increased as we've seen a number of successful and unsuccessful situations at these different companies. So, you know, we can tie it back to, you know, well, our manufacturing channels at cha uh, challenges at Gelsite three years ago are actually very similar to this. And this is how we solve that problem. And so I, I would say, actually, like our value gets better the more situations that we see. Um, but you know, we take a lot of those learnings from not only ourselves, but the people that we come best with. Great, Sam. Um, I mentioned, I saw on your website, you guys do both early and growth stage investing. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a question based off that. Um, I know, obviously, diligence is super important for hard tech companies. And I was curious how that process changes between the kind of early stage investing and growth stage investing, especially for the kinds of companies that you're investing in. Yeah, um, the early stage companies, uh, it's more, I would say it's more about the vision and you know, what you've been able to prove so far. Uh, obviously, there's always engineering challenges, especially the earlier you go. The, the later you go, it's more about you know, do you have the customer traction? Do you have the contracts? Do you have you know, the IP to sustainably you know, defend yourself and grow this company? Right? So that's where I think the financial element actually becomes a lot more important. You know, the finances are important at, at seed or Series A, but it's, it's, it's less than a company that's going to be getting $100 million. 
It's like, if I'm going to put $100 million into you, uh, I would like to have a return on that or multiple. And that's where actually I think there's a lot of timidness uh, in the growth capital stage today. So you, you look at I'll use battery again because this is what I know, but like, you know, companies like Group 14, Sela, R Next Energy, a 6K, right? To get an offtake agreement from a cell maker, they have to have an established supply chain. To get that manufacturing facility, they need money. They're not going to get money unless they have, you know, offtake agreements from customers. So it's like kind of this chicken and egg problem. Um, and so, you know, scaling up smartly and having a pathway to revenue without needing like a ton more investment is always something that we kind of are very critical on. One more uh, over here, and then maybe I'll ask Will to say a few words at the end. It's okay with you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, so as you alluded earlier, I think it's increasingly hard to talk about energy transition without geopolitics. Mm -hmm. And um, just, just been simply because we haven't been making a lot of the hard tech stuff domestically. And I'm curious if you think the current venture model uh, is and it is capable of supporting that domestic innovation. And maybe do you think the strategy is to invest in innovating our way out of it? Or do we need a different kind of, not just patient, but also, quote, unquote, like patriotic capital? Um, that's a really good question. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, on that one. <laughs> uh, truthfully, I think we need some innovation on the VC ecosystem, especially at the growth capital stage, just because of that. Like that very thing that I said is that there is this chicken and egg problem that ends up happening with a lot of clean tech industrial tech companies, where they need you know thirty to one hundred million dollars to build that supply base so they can get that contract, but there's still a lot of risk, right? So a traditional you know venture fund, you know if I'm going to put you know five to fifteen million dollar checks in, where you're going to need a lot of us or some big check writers in there to to support that growth. And if we've already put you know, $20 million into that company, we are not positioned to do that again for the big one. Right? So those downstream partners, I think, is actually where there's a lot of opportunity, but there's also a lot of risk. So I don't have like, the best answer for that, but I, personally, I think there's innovation that's required there. Great. Last word to Will. Well, Josh, really enjoyed the talk a lot. I want to just add one thing. So I think Josh emphasized sort of the journey of a startup, uh, you know, from founding to getting the product out to deployment. Uh, but I think there's also one sort of hidden thread behind Josh's remark, which is that it takes an entire ecosystem to get something out, whether it's supply chain, whether it's customer. It's about sort of changing the minds of everybody in the industry. And it's not just for you know, us in the United States, but also, you know, partners and colleagues and competitors in China as well. Um, so I also encourage you to zoom out a little bit and view it as a whole for decarbonization technology to work. It's unlikely to sort of only require the success of one or two or three companies, but a collection of companies. And I think another thing to realize is that even companies like Solyndra had a role to play in the industry of solar. Uh, we have to make these mistakes, and there have to be generations of talent that went through that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these scars are also really important. So I think looking beyond just sort of the success of one company through the lens of one company, we can also start looking at it through the lens of many companies. And I feel us here at Stanford have particularly the pleasure of taking a bird's eye view of how the industry is developing. So Josh, thank you for highlighting us to this sort of individual company journey, but also how it fits in the bigger picture. Um, so I think it's an enormous opportunity that I hope many of us will contribute to. So Josh, thank you again for coming to speak to us. Thank you. Thank you.